my biggest guidance is really around without a customer, you probably don't have a company, probably I would say. So I think one of the traps that I've been in a lot of times, a lot of my failures in my startups has been around focusing on the technology and not the problem. This is Velocitize Talks, and I'm Eric Jones. I'm here with Evan Shellshear, who's the head of analytics at Biari. Evan, great to have you. Great to be here, Eric. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, Biari and uh, you know what makes you unique in the marketplace. So Biari is kind of founded on the principle that for the last 10,000 years, we as a race have made some amazing advancements in the area of mathematics and science and, and even computer science more recently. What BRA as a business is trying to do is to take that and make it more accessible to companies because mathematics as a tool is probably one of the most powerful tools that exists. And what we're doing is we're taking that complicated 10,000 year deep edifice of human exploration and knowledge and revealing it via things like web interfaces and tools, digital tools online to help people exploit that and use that to benefit their business. What are some of the most common uh, areas uh, that you're actually helping clients in? There's a lot of areas. So there was a saying back in the 60s that became quite famous in mathematics. It was from a guy called Eugene Wigner, and he talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And behind that concept was the fact that these abstract principles can be applied almost anywhere. So some of the big areas that we're seeing is definitely marketing. Marketing as an industry has matured a lot and it's come from the phase where things were based on intuitions, things were based on generic principles, like there existed a Joe Average who lived in the suburbs, drove this type of vehicle and had this type of job and earned this type of wage. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. People are very specific about who they are and what they're like. And so driving a, that's driving a data-led revolution and as soon as that data comes into play, that's where mathematical models come to shine. I would think something like personalization and, and more importantly, personalization at scale creates enormous opportunities for you, which, which seems to be the holy grail these days in, in marketing. Absolutely. I think there's been a paradigm shift from the idea that you were targeting who people were in the past, but now we need to target people based on their behaviors. It's a fundamental shift in the thought process. So we no longer want to say you're 29, you live in this suburb, you earn this amount, you're this type of middle class, but more so say, what are your behaviors? Because exactly those characteristics that I listed could define a human being that has totally different tastes and perspectives. And so we're letting the behavior now define how we personalize things and how we target. And I know a lot of people have a level of resistance to that, but I would rather receive information for me that's relevant to my circumstances than be blanketed by information that's just bound for anyone in anything in particular. So you talked about um, you know, the, some of these persistent myths that exist around data, um, you know, the demographic stuff versus mm -hmm. behaviors and things like that. What are some other examples of, of myths that you see persist throughout, throughout companies? The biggest myth is more is better. I think that's the biggest myth around data. The more data, the better. And I think that's a big mistake. The what should be spent is its quality, not quantity. You can collect as much bad data as you want, but if it's not of a decent quality, you're going to be challenged to get any, any value out of it whatsoever. AI is one of the hottest things, one of the hottest technologies mm -hmm. out there today. Um, it's being used to drive you know, more predictive, more personal, more human experiences. How do you see it playing out in, in your world? I see it playing out in, in terms of being more prevalent in lots of aspects of the business. However, I feel there's kind of a period of realization of those benefits. I think a lot of people underestimate the effort involved to apply and utilize AI. I think people think it's a magic switch you can turn on. But given what I said previously about data and the fact that it's driven by data, if you have poor quality data, then you're not going to be able to get good quality AI. The old saying in computer science is garbage in, garbage out. And so I think a lot of companies don't realize the quality of their data. However, I have to admit, if you're a company that's running things on handwritten pieces of paper, they're getting transferred to Excel sheets, you're not alone. Right. Um, so <clears throat> AI um, you know, is, is slowly creeping into a lot of businesses. What are some of the most common areas, common benefits that mm -hmm. these companies are seeing as a result of their adoption of AI? Absolutely. I think a big one is better prediction of the future a lot better kind of forecasting, a lot better what-if analysis that people are doing. 
they're able to ask questions around what's going to happen tomorrow. So AI is really assisting with a lot of that stuff. I think that personalization that you mentioned is becoming big. And the only reason it's becoming big is because of tools like CRMs that are allowing us to collect more high quality data automatically. And so we're seeing in the marketing industry the ability to cater AI algorithms to that personalization. And Amazon and other companies are now releasing off the shelf products like Recommender and Personalize that almost anyone can use in addition to other AI tools like chatbots like Lex and things like that that now exist in the market for which any company can now tap into and apply. And I think I'm seeing that as quite an interesting trend where it's making AI more accessible and in a way that also creates better ROI. So not just doing AI for AI's sake, but actually being able to justify it with the bottom line. Mm -hmm. What are some of the biggest challenges, uh, reasons for resisting adopting AI in, in the enterprise that you come across? So one of the biggest resistances that I see at a C-suite level is one of responsibility. So what that means is that if you replace people with AI, what you're missing then is someone's butt to kick when things go wrong. <laughs> Funnily enough, so people lack that kind of chain of responsibility. And I've genuinely seen resistance where people are saying, well, we're not going to implement AI here because if we do, then who's going to get fired when things go wrong? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, tech, AI is such a broad term, mm. right? Uh, 27, 28 different technologies that sort of comprise what we yeah. broadly describe as, as AI. Um, what are some of the future trends that, that you see coming down the pike in AI. Absolutely, a big one we're seeing right now is actually simplification of AI. A simplification, it's, it's actually going and bucking the trend as to this deeper, bigger, larger neural networks. There's been some recent publications that have are really aimed for that holy grail of how can we train an AI with very little data? How can we achieve the same outcome as a big deep neural network but with a fraction of the data? And that's really the challenge. And, MIT produced an article this week showing that just by siphoning off small parts of deep neural networks, they can achieve similar results to the entire network. But a big one that I'm seeing is around the idea of fast and frugal, or frugal heuristics. And fast and frugal heuristics build upon the idea that we can capture a large part of the problem and solve a large part of the problem with simple uh, data-driven techniques such as basic decision trees that are built upon deeper statistical analysis and less upon a higher reliance on data. So this is definitely a trend I'm seeing that I expect to take more and more of the limelight merely because of the fact that it solves a couple of AI's problems around explainability, around causality, and a few of these other challenges for a full-scale AI adoption. Seems like it might be a little bit of an extrapolation of the Pareto principle, right? Mm. Where 20% of the results... This is it. Yeah. This is it. And I think people are realizing that that extra 20% to get the end of the way is not required. And they're asking themselves the question in the beginning now, what type of performance do I truly need from this algorithm to be happy? And one of the key things that we do at Biari is really around the idea of making decision support tools. So instead of just trying to fully automate the process with AI, we try and get 80% of the way, but keep the human in the loop. That satisfies, ma that satisfies management's demand to be able to hold someone responsible, but it also keeps people feeling like they're in control by allowing them to make the final decision. We support that decision with AI. How do you ensure that um, bias doesn't creep into the various algorithms, the various uh, solutions that, that you uh, help to build? That's a very challenging one, in fact, around bias. And some of the, even, even on the research front, it's not a solved question. It's not simple to do that. What we're finding typically is bias is not necessarily in the algorithm itself. There's nothing about a neural network per se that should be biased, but it's the data sets that create that bias. And so I guess what we're trying to do is preemptively think through the data sets that we're seeing before feeding them into these algorithms. You've talked about uh, how R&D doesn't happen in a vacuum, um, and you recommend bringing both you know, sales and marketing into the development. What did, what did you mean by that? What I really meant is a lot of startups have demonstrated this idea that by creating cross-functional teams, we're able to innovate faster and more effectively. I think in a lot of the movements around things like build, measure, learn cycle and, and those types of lean startup is really about reducing waste. So the goal of merging departments is to reduce that waste by stopping people getting things wrong. 
So I think largely the idea behind that is the more people that are involved that are able to give a meaningful opinion, and we're not talking about involving the whole marketing department or the whole sales department, but representatives from each to say, hey, look, let's look at this holistically, because even if you as a team build this, it's not going to work with us further down the line. And I think that kind of resolves those issues. Um, you've uh, launched quite a few companies. Uh, wondered what type of guidance you had for entrepreneurs that are out there. My biggest guidance is really around without a customer, you probably don't have a company, probably I would say. So I think one of the traps that I've been in a lot of times, a lot of my failures in my startups has been around focusing on the technology and not the problem. And I think just reiterating that for everyone out there that, hey, don't forget that you have to be solving someone's problem and creating value. And until you're doing that and have a customer, then you don't have a business. I want to go back to the AI uh, questions a little bit. Um, the general public, you know, by some surveys, still fears AI. Mm. Why should they actually not fear AI? I think they should not fear AI because it's like any technology. There are benefits and there are, well, there are pros and there are cons. And I think by focusing on the cons, you can obviously create a lot of fear, but then you miss out on the pros. And I think just like anything, like a plane, you could fear that it's going to fall out of the sky. But the reality is the most dangerous part of your plane trip is the car trip to the airport. And so I think by focusing on the wrong parts of this, this creates the fear. I think there are definitely scenarios where AI can be misused. And it's not the technology itself. It's the underlying organizations that may misuse it. Governments we're seeing in China with large facial recognition campaigns that have got hundreds of millions of people within their database that are able to recognize and track their movements around a city. It's not necessarily something that I would want to want to have happen to me, to know that people are following me all around all day, and that it's not necessarily in the fact that the technology would be recording that and that data is there, but it would be what could people do with that who were perhaps less than morally kind of responsible, responsible individuals, yeah. Right. Um, so a question we'd like to ask all our guests is a book that you'd like to recommend other than your best-selling book, Innovation <laughs> Tools. Um, what, would, what would you like to recommend? One of my favorite books, if you're a bit of a techie, was Algorithms to Live By. I love that book. I thought it was fantastic, but it's probably more for the technically oriented side of people. But another great book I really enjoyed was Philip Teclock's uh, Super Forecasting. I thought that was a great book too, and that kind of ties into a little bit of what AI is trying to do, predict the future. But does it in the way of, of asking human beings to do it this time and ch check how far they can predict in advance. What do you think is next after AI? Look, I think AI is one stepping stone in a bigger picture. Within an organization, what we're seeing is AI is part of a holistic solution and it's only one part of that. So typically what AI helps you to do is to predict something, to understand and and try and figure out what's going to happen next or, or who should we target or what we should do. What it doesn't then tell you to do is what decision to make. It doesn't help you further understand who's the optimal person to target. How can I optimally allocate my budget? What can I do? And I guess that's something we do a lot of at BI with our optimization techniques is we do the AI and then on top of the AI, we build further mathematical tools that can then optimize those decisions and all those suggestions that come out of the AI to help people make real decisions. Evan, thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. That was Evan Shellshear, the head of analytics at BRE.